Hello and welcome to a special edition of Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. New York's 2018 election season is gearing up. Almost all statewide seats are up for grabs this year. Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Comptroller, as well as U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's seat. All of the 27 seats from New York in the U.S. House of Representatives and all of the seats in the state legislature, 63 state Senate seats and 150 assembly seats are also at play. There's a lot to watch for this year. Race to Represent will bring you coverage of as many races as we can. Our first special election is Tuesday, April 24th. Candidates are seeking the vacant seat in the 74th Assembly District. A debate among all four candidates vying for that seat and seeking your vote on April 24th is right after this show. My guest with me now couldn't be more qualified to discuss the 2018 election year. It's Brendan Cheney from Politico New York and Dr. Christina Greer, an Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University. So thank you both for being here. So Christina, let's start at the top of the ticket, the big race that's going to dominate a lot of this election season, the race for governor. Mm -hmm. uh, governor Cuomo seeking a third term. He's being challenged from the left. He's got people on his right lining up to challenge him if he makes it through the primary. Uh, what are you watching here in the early going in the gubernatorial race? Well, the third term is never as easy as, as many people think it is. You know, it's much easier to ask someone for a second term because you can say, I've been here only four years and I still have quite a bit of my agenda that I'd like to accomplish. Asking for a third term is a little more complicated. You're essentially going back to the voters and saying, I've been here seven and a half, eight years, and I'd like years 9, 10, 11, and 12 to continue my mission. Well, what has been your mission and what have you done for the past almost decade? So I think that that's a, that's a harder sell. I think for Cuomo, he's also in a bit of a tight situation just because he does have sort of some corruption trials of his inner circle that will occur this summer. And, you know, so many people are so tired of the corruption in Albany, even this idea of corruption, where they can look to the governor and sort of his inner circle and say, are they part of the problem? Is he part of the problem? As far as the challenge on the left with Cynthia Nixon, I mean, she does represent someone who is an outsider. We saw in the 2016 election and elections across the country, sometimes celebrities, I mean, they all range in skill set and quality, um, but some people really do want someone who's not entrenched in government politics to come in with new ideas, maybe new people. Uh, Cynthia Nixon has been politically active for quite some time. She is relatively well known, but she also knows how to connect with an audience in a way that the governor just... <laughs> It's not a strong suit. Um, and we do know that he, he struggles with sort of dealing with smart women on an interpersonal basis. And then as far as the right is concerned, um, if the Republicans can put up someone who's not a Trumpite, but who represents maybe, I would say, a 21st century version of a Pataki, uh, then I think Cuomo has some real cha you know, really challenging troubles ahead of him if he can even get through the primary, because some people are really frustrated with his constant bickering and fights with the mayor of New York City, with the fact that they feel like he's dropped the ball on several issues, ranging from housing to the environment, to sort of not being a progressive Democrat, and also sort of uh, co-signing the IDC and all of their sort of Republican-esque behavior. Yes. Let's follow up on a few things you said, <laughs> but Brendan, you know, broad strokes, I mean, what are you looking at as this campaign really gets going here? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the primary is, is sort of the, the first thing to happen, and that's going to be, I think, uh, the most interesting um, to begin with. And, you know, trying to see if, if Cynthia Nixon can uh, come anywhere close to the support that Zephyr Teachout had in 2014. Um, it's really hard to predict because, you know, Zephyr Teachout did well upstate, right? Like Hudson Valley, Catskills, Capital Region, even the North Country a bit, and then, and then over into central New York. Uh, but that was based on... Um, hydrofracking and environmental issues and, and some other things that are not really issues anymore, right? So like what is, um, what are going to be the things that animate Democratic primary voters this fall? Um, and you know, uh, Cynthia Nixon's trying to do uh, a lot more in the city where Cuomo is actually really strong. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see what, what are voters going to care about in the fall and will they be, will Cynthia Nixon be someone who can deliver on those things? I think you raise a very interesting point, which is Zephyr Teachout put forth with very no name recognition at the start of her campaign, almost no money, getting a late start, no institutional backing, uh, put together a pretty solid campaign and won a third of the primary vote, right? Mm -hmm. 
Cynthia Nixon starts in a totally different position. She starts a lot earlier. She's easily able to raise money, you know, pretty quickly just based on having some name recognition, having a background, having a reasonably, you know, strong campaign infrastructure to start. But on the other hand, some of those issues that were big issues in 2013 into 14 are gone, or at least partially gone. And you know, the other thing that motivated a lot of the teach out voters, not only was the environmental issues led by fracking, but was also education reform and high stakes testing and the opt out movement. And Governor Cuomo has basically reversed himself on all of that. So that energy is not there anymore. The teachers unions are much more quiet around Cuomo. Well, I think that, I don't think that uh that uh, Cynthia Nixon will do as well upstate as Zephyr Teachout did, but I do think that she could chip into his downstate base. I mean, we know that she, she announced in Brownsville. We know that she's made it explicit that she will go after black women as sort of the keepers of the Democratic Party and the keepers of democracy. We know that many people in her campaign and the camp are post-Zephyr Teachout folks. Zephyr Including Teachout Zephyr Teachout. is yes. the <laughs> treasurer of her campaign. Yes. You know, she's got sort of uh, political consultants who are not novices, they're sort of the architects of Bill de Blasio's very sort of surprising campaign in, in 2013. And so I think whenever we look at 2018, the shadow of 2020 is evident, just because even if Cynthia Nixon doesn't win uh, on September 13th uh, during the primary, if she gets anywhere near what Zephyr Teachout got in 2014, Andrew Cuomo's chances of, of being a contender in any capacity for the Democratic Party in 2020 are essentially evaporated. If you can't come out strong in New York, New York State, which is, you know, when you look at the map of 50, is like the bluest of the blue, then I think that the larger Democratic Party would have some real concerns about him as a viable candidate. Well, especially if, you're, if he would have to be eyeing winning a primary for president, right? You, you have to speak to that, that base. Um, what, what is at stake for Andrew Cuomo here? Does Cynthia Nixon have a chance? Like I said, it's going to be hard to see what the <clears throat> what the issues are that she can get primary voters to, to vote on. Right? I mean, it's really, really hard to beat an incumbent, especially in a primary. Um, and he's, I think, as much as he's done a pretty bad job at the beginning of responding to her attacks, right, in uh, in the press, on the policy side, he's been trying his best to try and remove the things that would be uh, rallying points for her. Right? So he's worked with the IDC and the Democrats in the Senate to come back together, putting up money for public housing. Uh, he's working on the MTA to some degree, right? I mean, he's trying to, to, to get rid of everything that could be a negative in, in an upcoming primary. Yeah, it seems like, at least to start, she's focused on education funding, which has been her issue. That's the thing where if she's been involved in politics, mm -hmm. that's been the number one thing. She's had a couple other causes for sure that she's been involved with, but she's been around and she's been an advocate and closely aligned with the main uh, education advocacy group, Alliance for Quality Education, that focuses on education funding. So that's her main topic, and she's attacked the governor on that, and he comes back and says, our per pupil funding at the state level is the highest in the country, right? And so he is trying to head off that attack to some degree. They also put you know, some new measures in the state budget to force cities, especially in New York, to show where that funding then goes, school by school. I don't know how far that's gonna take them in the primary, but um, at least it's another measure to, to needle Mayor de Blasio. Uh, but clearly, education funding and the MTA are right at the top of how she's attacking him. But she is also gonna have to go upstate, right? She's gonna have to, to speak to voters outside of the MTA region. Right, but I, I think she has time to sort of craft that message. We know that the governor is going to start giving out Easter eggs to all the electeds. You know, just we've already seen that because he needs them to endorse him. And, you know, there have been many people downstate, especially, who've been a little slow on the uptake oh, to yeah. say, like, we'll just wait and see. But I do think, especially when it comes to MTA funding, I think that that's where Cynthia Nixon can pick off a lot of Cuomo um, supporters, especially in a primary. We have to think about the types of people who turn out in primary. This is purely anecdotally, but you know, four years ago when I would, you know, sit on a stalled subway and you'd hear people say like, "Thanks a lot, De Blasio," <laughs> right? And you know, I'd secretly whisper like, "It's not really him." <laughs> but now, four years later, clearly something in the marketing has changed because when we're all sitting in a dilapidated subway car, people are railing against Cuomo. So there, there's an there's an issue education that clearly has occurred in those past four years. So I think that that's one piece. The second piece with housing, 
you know, if Cynthia Nixon can make the case where it's like, this is the former HUD director, and this is where our New Yorkers are living, right? 400,000 New York people in New York City live in public housing. But I believe if we look at the numbers of 2014, I think 20% of Cuomo's downstate voter population came from public housing. So if Cynthia Nixon can make some inroads downstate, she'll sort of compensate for that. And then over the summer, I think, whether it's cleaning up Albany and corruption or whatever issue pops up, you know, she, she has a stronger foothold. But I think she also represents the civil war in the Democratic Party, which is when you say you're a Democrat, do you want to be a progressive Democrat or a centrist sort of Cuomo Clinton Democrat a la the 1990s to sort of pick up that, that largest group in the middle? And some Democrats think that that's the best strategy moving forward to get those weak-leaning Republicans and independents. And others, I think, sort of the Cynthia Nixon primary voters would say, no, if you're a Democrat, I want you on the left fighting for progressive issues and no compromise. She came out swinging on that front, right? Calling, uh, basically calling Cuomo a fake Democrat. Mm -hmm. and, and he has responded, as you said, by pretty quickly after the state budget was passed, announcing that he has brokered a deal between this fractious conference of Democrats, eight members, to come back to the mainline Democrats. They still don't have a majority in the state Senate. They're trying to work on that. There's some special elections coming up April 24th and then the fall as well. And we've seen the governor not only do that, but then also he's been campaigning in Westchester where there's a very important state Senate seat uh, up for election on April 24th and campaigning on Long Island where there's key races coming up in the fall. Uh, it seems like he's maybe approaching this differently than he has in the past because he sees that vulnerability? Yeah, that and I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you can see him trying to get union support as well, right? Knowing that, like, you know, uh, primary voters are often members of unions, and so the more union support he can get, uh, um, the more support he'll have in the primary, and I think also maybe the, the more likely he will be to get the Working Families Party line again, which was, he did get in 2014, but it was a big fight, and he had to make some concessions that I think he didn't want to make. Um, so I think those are all things he's doing to try and shore up his left. And so we've talked a bit here about how Cynthia Nixon's attacking him. We should mention that former mayor of Syracuse, Stephanie Miner, is still considering a run for governor. She might jump into this Democratic primary mix, which would toss the whole thing in a, you know, in a new direction in terms of um, it not really being a one-on-one -on -one battle, which could complicate things quite a bit. We're talking a bit about how she, Cynthia Nixon's attacking him from the left, the fracture in the Democratic Party that this indicates. What's the governor running on? You know, he's, he's had to try to shore up some of these issues, but if you ask him and many others, he has a record, right? He has a record to run on. He's accomplished some things going back to the first term, uh, marriage equality, a pretty major piece of gun control legislation. Uh, how is his record, I mean, what do you make, what do you make of his record? I mean, when you hear him talk, whether it's whether he's you know criticizing Bill De Blasio or or campaigning against Cynthia Nixon, he talks a lot about his experience in getting things accomplished. Right, that that he says Bill De Blasio campaigns a lot of things and tries to push for a lot of things, but Cuomo is the one who can get things done. Right, so whether it's minimum wage, like you said, marriage equality, that there are these things that he has done. You know, on time budgets for I think. Every year, if not every year, then almost Very every year, close, and the one right. that was not was close. And for folks that don't know, before Governor Cuomo came into power, that was not the case often in Albany. And he right. has really, even though there's still major problems with how things get voted on in the middle of the night often and things of that nature, he has brought some semblance of order back to state government that was that was lacking for a right, while. Right, right. Yeah. But going back to what, what you said earlier, uh, you know, he, he's, it sounds like what he's talking about is, is effective management, but I, I don't hear a lot about what are the things he hasn't done that he wants to do, right? It's like, you should trust me because I can do things, but I'm not sure what it is that he's left undone that he needs four more years to do. I haven't heard that articulated yet. And to your point, he talks about having been able to get these things through a divided legislature, but people turn around and say, hey, well, you, you it, helped create that divided because legislature. Because of you, right. And, you know, and I think for Cynthia Nixon, who is doing some real retail politicking, in black communities, I don't think that she's going to miss an opportunity to remind voters, female voters, voters of color, 
female voters of color, that part of the reason why there was so much gridlock was because Andrew Cuomo was stripping power away from Andrea Stewart Cousins. And symbolically, having the governor taking power away from the most powerful woman in state government, the most powerful woman of color in state government, doesn't fall on deaf ears. I think the sort of fighting with de Blasio is getting on a lot of people's nerves. I mean, it's sort of, you know, if you grew up with a sibling, it's like the oldest sibling should be the mature one, right? Even if they're in the wrong, it's like, you're, you know, most of the times your parents are like, you know, you're the oldest, do better. <laughs> and so I think some people are feeling like, well, you're the governor, because so much of the mayor's budget is tied up in the state budget. You know, there's so much that the mayor actually can't get done because he has to go with his tin cup to Albany. And because of this rift between these two men, we, we, we see New Yorkers suffering in many ways. So I'm, I'm curious as to how he frames these progressive issues, but also these centrist issues at the same time, because he seems a little schizophrenic at times. Sometimes he comes to voters and says, I'm the most progressive mayor you've, or progressive governor you've ever seen, and I've, I've done marriage equity. It's like, well, we were number 17. Like, if you were really on it, we could have been in the top five. And that five, was in 2011. Yes. Exactly. It's, so it's what have you done for me mm -hmm. lately, right? And so he sometimes says he's the most progressive, but then other times he puts things up, but then he sort of knows that it'll never get through Albany and doesn't really follow through. I'm thinking about some of his prison reform stuff where if you're not really paying attention, it's like, oh, wow, you know, if you're a progressive voter, you really think that he's pushing this agenda. And it's like, no, he just kind of threw it out there, but there was never any intention to fund it or follow through. Well, well a few of the things you said hit on the fact that Andrew Cuomo is a masterful politician in, in many ways. Now, he's made a lot of mistakes and he stumbles sometimes and he's flubbed some of the early Cynthia Nixon challenges. Um, but you can already see this issue of not empowering Andrew Stewart Cousins. He's trying to take that off the table by announcing this unification deal. He came to the table, though, with the unification deal right after a budget was passed where he was able to, again, sort of play the middle ground. And now he's saying, well, the things we didn't get in this budget, now those are the things we need to accomplish with a full Democratic legislature, right? And so he has that talking point now the question in my mind around some of that and other uh, of the Democratic Party machinations are, have people's awareness heightened to the point, especially primary voters, that there's enough people now who know all that, who've seen it all, that he actually pays a price because of the election of Donald Trump, because the IDC has been around for a long time, that people have, and because Cuomo has been around for a long time, that people have sort of understand some of those political tricks that he's playing and because he's been around a while, uh, they might not work so well this year. Or, as people start to really pay attention to the election, which isn't going to happen still for weeks and months, does everything he's saying sound pretty good? I think it's, I think it's harder to make a talking point that uh, the governor had for a long time empowered the IDC, but now isn't, instead of going into the election saying, like, the governor is still empowering the IDC. Right? And I think it's the same with the people who are challenging the IDC, by the way, is like now they're saying, like, well, we don't trust them, but for a long time they were with Republicans, even though they're not now. Right? I think that's a much harder talking point to make uh, to say that, um, that this used to be the case, but it's not anymore. And so I, you know, I, I think it's going to be hard for people to use that as a, as a really effective. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, but I also do think there is a heightened awareness, and I don't know where that's going right. to gonna come down, but I do think that makes a lot of sense. I just wanted to add, you know, you mentioned criminal justice reform, the notion of bail reform and making major changes to uh, the requirements around bail did not make it into the budget, although the governor has said he supports that. That's one of the premier things he's saying still needs to be accomplished, the DREAM Act, uh, early voting, campaign finance reform, you know, there is a pretty big list of things right. that he went through in a very interesting fashion, you know, sort of admitting that he wasn't able to get them passed, but then pointing blame on the Republican-led state right. Senate and saying, now we're going to accomplish this. Very, very similar to what he did four years ago, by the way. Right. It's a very similar playbook. And I think if Nixon can sort of help braid that rope to help voters understand, you know, it's difficult for you to vote. We're number 38 in the nation because of him, right, as far as ease of early voter registration and turning out. You know, like criminal justice reform, if you're a progressive Democrat and you care about this stuff, we actually are, you know, whatever number in the nation because of the governor. So as we get closer to September, I think the summer is going to give us a lot. Um, if Nixon can sort of make this case, it's like, yeah, maybe he has done a lot. However, for the, the core issues and values that we still really care about, they always 
seem to get you know thrown by the wayside. Now, what could help Cuomo quite a bit, I think, in September is if our president is in shambles, which who knows, he seems like he's a phoenix as well, where he just keeps rising from the ashes. But just in case he isn't, I think Cuomo can also look to voters and say, well, you know what, we tried, we tried the celebrity, and we actually need someone who does understand government, who has worked in government as long as I have, and so she may have some great ideas, I'll adopt some of them, and I'll think about the others, but maybe we need to have someone who is entrenched in Albany, forget about the scandals and everything that happened this summer, I'm the adult of the two candidates. It's, it's definitely another interesting dynamic because you do have the outsider who has some experience in policy mm -hmm. and, and is a very different candidate than Donald Trump, of course, in Cynthia Nixon. But where are voters in terms of stability, mm -hmm. someone who's been there, someone who has a very long government uh, resume? I don't think we know that yet. It would be interesting to see if there's some polling on that. It would be interesting to see if even just after a, a few weeks or a couple of months of campaigning, if Nixon's poll numbers begin to rise, you know, one of the things about her is she's going to get a lot of media attention. You know, she's not Zephyr Teachout, who people are not taking that, ser you know, seriously. I mean, she's getting a lot of attention, uh, and, you know, that may serve her well, or you might just have this right. really strong block of Democratic voters who know Cuomo, know the Cuomo name, feel like the state is doing okay, uh, at least, and, you know, are, are okay with continuity when you have chaos in Washington. The state Senate, as we've indicated, the entire state legislature, both houses, on the ballot this fall. Uh, we have some special elections coming up April 24th. Everybody should also know, we could talk about this if we have some time towards the end, congressional primaries in June. New York has a very complicated voting system, as we've uh, touched on. There are separate primaries for Congress and for the state level seats. So you have congressional primaries in June. In September, we have the state-level primaries, the Cuomo-Nixon, but also the entire state legislature is on the ballot this fall, and then, of course, the November general election. So state Senate control is at stake in this election. Why does that matter? Most, most of those elections that matter are not in New York City, but why do New York City voters care? Well, the, the fate of the state Senate hangs in the balance, right? Uh, right now, there are 31 Republicans and one Democrat who caucuses with the Republicans, right? So they've got uh, majority control of the body. Um, and so I, the hope is that the, you know, the Democrats are hoping that they can win enough seats in November to take control, We're working with the IDC, right? There's eight, eight IDC members, I think 21 Democrats, there's two vacancies. Um, and if you, you know, I think everybody nationally and it seems locally, the feeling is the environment is better for Democrats this time because of how bad Trump is doing. Um, and so there is this possibility. I think Democrats are looking at, I think there's, there's eight seats, I was looking, eight Senate seats that are held by Republicans where Democrats have an enrollment advantage, right? It's so like those are the seats they're going to be targeting. Eight, Long Island many. and Hudson Valley, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure they'll target every one of sure. those, right? But those are places where Democrats can look to, and what they need, you know, I think just, just one seat, really. I think they'll want more than that, yeah, right? A you want a bigger, be, yeah, bigger majority. Would, would but, you know, it, it looks like they could, they have a good chance of, of getting enough seats to, to take back the majority if the IDC stays with them. Right. And we, we folks should know the state assembly is in Democratic control and will be probably forever. You know, the part of what some people are upset with Andrew Cuomo about is the redistricting that he oversaw and wound up signing off on uh, after the last census that helped create very strong Democratic Assembly uh, seats and very strong Republican Senate seats, even though Republicans are really trying to hang on to any semblance of power at the state level. You have a Democrat governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, controller, all statewide seats on the ballot this year. And then you have the state legislature where the Republicans are, are holding on to control of the Senate. And really, largely thanks to Brooklyn Senator Sim Kefelder, who is a Democrat and a Republican and, and caucus of the Republicans. So a lot of this, a lot of these policies, like bail reform, like early voting, people are saying, including the governor, that these are basically on the ballot this fall, right? That if the state senate goes democratic, you're going to see a wave of mm -hmm. progressive policies move through. Do you buy that? Is that we could? The case? I mean, what's you know, for me, the the, the sort of necessity of, of getting these seats back is for the census and and redistricting when it sort of comes comes through. So we know we have the 2020 census. We know we'll start redrawing some lines around 2021. So getting people in place past their first election, you know, once you sort of 
successfully win your first election. The second one is a little bit better. Unless and you're then, arrested. Yes. And then, you know, <laughs> you can become Charlie Wrangle and win 23 races over 46 years. So, to me, that's what I'm really looking at. And, you know, when we look at so many of these primary uh, numbers, you know, for so many of these districts, the primary is the general race, right? I mean, once you get through the primary, there's sometimes not even a challenger on the ballot. We're seeing people go to Albany with 8,000, mm -hmm. 10,000 votes, maybe. Um, and these are people who are in charge of budgets worth in the billions, like worth more than some countries, actually. Um, and they're deciding things not just about bail reform and prisons, but about our bodies and our families and our education. So, to and funding for our education especially. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to ring the alarm about. I think also, though, you brought up this really important point about our American democracy and sort of the lack of civics education. We ask our electorate in New York to go to the polls so often. We just had uh, local elections last year. So that means if you're a participatory Democratic voter in New York, New York State, you have a special election in April, depending on where you are, and you need to know where, whether or not you should be participating. And then you've got the congressional primaries in June, the state Senate and state legislature primaries in September, and then in November for the general. That's four different times that some New Yorkers are going to vote. And they already voted three or four times right, just, right. last just year. Right, just city cycle. And three yeah. or four times the year before that. So I think that to me is also... Training people maybe to uh, yeah, just I mean, expect to vote three or yeah, four times exactly. a year. Yeah, It's a lot. I yeah. think it's a lot. And, and I don't think that it's voter apathy always. I think sometimes it's voter fatigue and just a lack of voter education. So that's also the piece that hopefully... A lack of voter uh, convenience. Yeah. Yeah, the, the lack of early voting. You know, <laughs> well, thanks is, to the governor, we have a lack of clear. convenience. Yeah. So in our last minute here, you know, we are setting the stage for this very important election cycle in New York. As, as you know, I indicated before, we also have these congressional seats, which are not about New York state government, but will contribute to who controls the House of Representatives in Washington after this election cycle. Democrats are hoping to flip the House. There are several New York districts, like you said about the state Senate, uh, there are several in the House, again, mostly not in New York City because of how d heavily Democratic it is, although the one Staten Island seat uh, is usually in play in some way. So people need to, to watch for that. And we also have U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is on the ballot this year. Uh, U.S. Senators are staggered, so we only have one senator on the ballot, and she is facing a Republican opponent. She also, like Andrew Cuomo, has some presidential buzz. So there's a lot a lot to watch for this year. Uh, final thought on on what's at stake, you know, in terms of the federal level uh, for the election cycle. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how uh, New York contributes to uh, what happens overall in Congress, right? I think the Democrats are hoping to be able to win enough seats to take back the House of Representatives. Um, in order to do that, they need, you know, they'll need to win in, in lots of different places. And so, like, you know, does New York contribute to a big wave with the, you know, there's a few Republicans that are, that are um, in really tough races this year. And they have to decide how to handle the Donald Trump question, mm -hmm. uh, which will also come back to the Republican side of the gubernatorial race, which I'm sure we'll discuss in the future. Christina Greer, Brendan Cheney, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. I moved to this neighborhood because it's a good combination of family-friendly area and also full of street life. It still has the feeling of old New York because of the narrow streets and we still have some mom and pop shops and not just chains. Uh, it's, it's an area to live in which ha uh, is on a human scale. Geographically, the district runs from Delancey Street uh, over the east, eastern part of the Lower East Side uh, along the waterfront all the way up to 47th Street. And it kind of zigzags, but it goes east of First Avenue. So it includes really diverse communities. It includes like what's known as Lower East Side, with a lot of people who live in public housing. It includes Stuyvesant Town, which is a huge complex with thousands of rent-stabilized tenants. Uh, it also includes uh, Peter Cooper Village, it includes uh, Kipps Bay and part of Murray Hill. So economically it's very diverse, you have very low incomes in the projects, 
uh, probably less than 17,000 uh, is the median income. And then you have uh, you know, people, household earning over six figures in other parts of the district. Uh, so we also have a lot of rent stabilized tenants in the district uh, because it's primarily renters. And they're at, at high risk of displacement also because there's just a lot of landlords who are trying to force rent stabilized tenants out to deregulate their apartments. Whoever's gonna represent that district really has to represent some very diverse interests. So there are many issues facing the 74th Assembly District. There's a massive disinvestment of public housing, so that's a big one. There's also issues around the hospital systems. We have uh, Beth Israel, which is going to be relocated soon, and so that's a major issue for you know, all the communities, uh, in particular folks with medical conditions, seniors, our disabled community. There's issues around transportation. The MTA is a hot mess, and so we think about the L train shutting down, you think about the buses working or not working. There's several issues at play um, with respect to uh, the East River waterfront. Certainly with respect to resiliency, the area suffered significant damage uh, during Hurricane Sandy. Community districts 3 and 6, which overlap significantly um, with the, the waterfront um, areas of Assembly District 74 had more than 40,000 people facing significant flood risk um, over the next uh, 40 years or so, um, which we define as a, a one in two chance of, of um, seeing an event uh, the magnitude of Sandy or larger. So the people who are living here who, who earn forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year Realistically, they're not looking to move elsewhere in New York City because they're just not going to find anything unless they happen to be one of the lucky ones who, who get an apartment through a housing lottery. So it's, it's just critical that we preserve the housing stock that we've got. It's segregated, just to let you know. It's only the gentrified people out here. And then after the gentrified people, it's just straight people who's poor. They're not broke, they're poor, you know? So I would like to see that change as well. I wish congestion pricing will be implemented so that we'll be less cars in our streets. I walk on the street with my five-year-old son. He says, Dad, I can't hear you because of the noise of the cars. We have dozens of families who ditched their cars because it's cheaper, it's cleaner, and it makes more sense. Right now, there's a cap on the zone, how much zoning you can build, how much, how much of a a lot you can utilize and so there's been a push in Albany to raise the cap and if they decide to do that I think that uh, they should have um, some of the communities that will be most impacted part of that process. If you really look at the business around here there's a lot of stores that's closed. Why? Because these landlords want to charge astronomical prices to people like me who grew up in the neighborhood, who's, I'm, I'm 41 years old, I've been cutting hair for 28 years, and I'm fortunate to have a store where I grew up. But the rent is crazy out here. So how do they expect the rent to be paid? The electric, the cable, the phone, anything that's overhead being paid if the rent is too high. Like, I think there's a legislation should be more enforced on landlords that just want to hike up prices, which is not fair for owners like me. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian Cooper. I represent the Republican Party for the State Assembly, running for the special election on April 24th. Um, the reason why that I'm running, because I want the people in our district to have a choice. You know, the choice for schools, a choice for um, public housing, a choice for Medicare and Medicaid for our seniors. I just want to give them the opportunity to make their voices heard. Now, how am I going to do that? I'm just going to go on a tour. Okay? I'm just going to go to every um, school board meeting and um, police community association meetings and also um, community board meetings to listen to you because I personally feel that your voice is not being heard in the right way okay because this is your district this is our district as well okay so and you want to know where all your money's going you want to know where all your money is being spent and where it's being allocated 
and you have the absolute right to voice your concerns and your opinions. Now, personally, I don't have all the answers. That's where you come in. Okay? You know your you know your neighborhoods more than anybody. So that's why when I come, I will listen to you and I will focus on everything, write everything down and bring it to Albany. So your voice will be represented as well as anybody else. Okay, because I personally feel that the Democrats are not doing what they're supposed to do. Okay. You need a choice. You need a, an alternative. Say, so, hey, listen, the Democrats had their chance. Now it's time for another voice, a Republican voice. I it will be that voice for you. I will make sure that you get your money's worth. I'm gonna make sure that your money's well spent, and I'm gonna make sure that it's allocated the way that you're supposed to be. Okay. My name is Ryan Cooper. Again, I'm running for the State Assembly in the 74th District on the Republican Party ticket, and I thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Adrienne Craig Williams. I live in Alphabet City, and I'm the Green Party candidate in this race. I've been an activist in our community for the New York Health Act, climate action, criminal justice reform, and Black Lives Matter. I do not accept corporate money, so I will only serve the needs of the district. I will fight for you even if you're undocumented, even if you're not wealthy, even if you can't vote. Thank you. Hola, me llamo Adrian Craig Williams y soy la candidata del Partido Verde. He sido activista en nuestra comunidad para acciones climáticas la reforma del sistema penal y las vidas negras importan. No acepto dinero de cooperaciones y los únicos intereses que serviré son las necesidades del distrito. Yo pelearé por ti, aunque no tengas documentos, aunque no tengas dinero, aunque no hables inglés. Muchísimas gracias. Vote Adrian. <música> Hello, my name is Harvey Epstein. I'm running for the New York State Assembly in the 74th District because public policy impacts people's lives. Throughout my career serving the people of this great city, I've learned firsthand that the key to strong leadership is to listen to the concerns of my fellow New Yorkers, then work with you to meet the challenges you face. My wife and I have been actively engaged in our community. I was a PTA president in my children's elementary school and spearheaded efforts to advance fair diversity admissions policies. As the chair of Community Board 3, I worked to protect the neighborhood from overdevelopment and displacement. As a public interest attorney for almost 25 years, I have represented thousands of people to help them stay in their homes. And I have fought to expand laws protecting tenants from harassment from their landlords. I build consensus, like I did creating a statewide legal services coalition after decades of inaction. After it was created, I was elected the first president by over 50 members, and we successfully lobbied for $100 million in funding for free civil legal services. This was the largest commitment of state funding in the nation. I fight for our community, like I did when MetLife sold Peter Cooper Village in Stuyvesant Town and tenants were being served with eviction notices. I started legal clinics and hotlines to defend those tenants. I am an effective leader who is able to organize a coalition of 30 neighborhood organizations to get the first and the second rent freeze in the 47-year history of the Rent Guidelines Board. In the State Assembly, I will focus on implementing a five-point plan for our community, fixing the MTA, preserving affordable housing, investing in public schools, improving voter access, and expanding social justice reforms. I do this work to improve the lives of New Yorkers. That is why I want to be your Assembly member, and I hope I can earn your support. Thank you. Hi, my name is Juan Pagan. The issues pressing our district are many. People are being displaced and priced out of their homes or barely making it paycheck to paycheck due to high rent. And those who live in New York City Housing Authority developments are living in deplorable conditions due to deliberate neglect as the city's plan to privatize public housing undermines the desperately needed repairs. And the MTA's poor and inadequate subway and bus service. 
and the Department of Education's inability to provide equal and quality education for all our children, regardless of socioeconomic status, and our senior citizens and those with disabilities whose services have decreased as gentrification has caused the loss of many certified nursing home beds and medical facilities and health issues, as a recent state report shows a significant increase of asthma in the East Village, mostly affecting our children and the elderly. Crime and safety. As the closing of Rikers Island adds a new challenge to the ones we are already facing, with its goal to release half of the inmate population, and to build new jails throughout the five boroughs, this will affect us all. And the list grows and clings as a burden that affects the quality of life we experience daily. However, the strategies, the plans, the ideas for all these issues are there. But it takes more than strategies to deal with these issues effectively. It takes a leader with character, the character to amend or dissolve policies that hinder the betterment of our well-being. It takes character to legislate policies that truly improve the quality of life for all who inhabit our district. My age, coupled with the wrenching and straining of life on the Lower East Side and New York City, got into the very pores and fiber of my character. Albany needs integrity and character. Vote for Juan. Thank you. Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York and Gotham Gazette, is pleased to welcome you to a debate among candidates running to fill the seat in the New York State Assembly District 74. I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. District 74 in the Assembly is on the east side of Manhattan and stretches from East Houston Street through the East Village, including Stuyvesant Town, to just north of the United Nations. The assembly seat has been vacant since December when Brian Kavanaugh resigned and was sworn in as a state senator. The special election is open to all who are registered to vote and live in Assembly District 74. There is no primary. The vote is April 24th. There are four candidates here with us. Starting from my left, we have the Republican candidate, Brian Cooper, the Democratic and Working Families candidate, Harvey Epstein the Green Party candidate, Adrian Craig Williams, and the Reform Party candidate, Juan Pagan. Each candidate will answer several rounds of questions with one-minute responses and 30-second rebuttals when needed. Each candidate will also have time at the end for a one-minute closing statement. So thank you all for being here. And Mr. Pagan, we're going to start with you. Uh, the same question will go around to everybody. But Mr. Pagan, how would you describe, for those that might not know it particularly well, what is the job of a state assembly member? How do you describe what the responsibilities are? Go ahead. The primary responsibility is to understand the people in his district, to have a connection with the people, uh, to have endured what the people in his district are, have been going through. Um, that's the first element. Without that, uh, to legislate laws or to repeal laws or to amend laws, uh, it, 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 it's those three elements now are important. But if you don't know the people, if you don't know what's been going on in your district, um, to, to write new laws or, as I said, to repeal ones that are not working or actually hurting the people or to amend laws to make them work better, you have to have a true understanding of what's going on in your community, in your district. And the fact that uh, I lived there for 62 years, which is my age, been there all my life, uh, it's ingrained within me. So, so the important element of being a state legislator is to legislate laws that actually work for the people, um, to legislate laws that um, reflect what the people are crying out about. And so that is uh, my brief um, explanation of what a lawmaker should be in the state. Thank, thank you. And Mr. Cooper, uh, how do you describe the job of an assembly member? Well, hands-on experience I learned from Brian Kavanaugh <laughs> and via Steve Sanders. And you're an ambassador. That's what you are. You're an ambassador representing your district. You go up to Albany representing the people. And how they went about it, where well, I'm going to go about it, is going to community board meetings, uh, police community council meetings, and um, 
also attend association meetings. This, this knowing, learning what's, what's going on. I mean, yeah, people are rambunctious, but that's fine. Write it down. Hey, I got you. I'm gonna go up to Albany, and that's what you are. You are an ambassador. You represent that district of who you are and what you, you know, what you learn, and that's it. That is all. Mr. Epstein, how do you define the role of the assembly member? So I've defined it in a couple of ways. One is to explain what we do in Albany, to talk to people about the House of Representatives that once part of Congress and the Senate, where in Albany, the, the assembly is the House of Representatives for Congress, and the Senate is the Senate. So people don't understand that there's two bodies in Albany as well, and we pass laws that the governor can sign and veto. But the more critical piece of what a uh, state representative is, is to be a part of, be a community organizer and understand the needs of the community and build leaders in our neighborhood and make a difference in the lives of New Yorkers. Thank you. And Ms. Craig Williams? Yes. Um, so everyone else has said pretty good things. I love the word ambassador. Um, the assembly member represents the community in Albany and represents Albany in the community, um, writes laws and uh, works to serve the people and be accountable to the people. Okay, so we're going to actually start right back with you, uh, Ms. Craig Williams, on the second question, and then we'll, we'll come around and we'll get, give everybody a chance to start and end and be in the middle uh, as we go here throughout the debate. So the second part to the opening question really is, how are you then qualified to fill that role? What makes you the right choice uh, to fill this seat? Right, so I'm the right choice because I am not a part of the regular political parties. Um, I'm a Green Party candidate, um, which means I don't, I'm not answerable to machine party or machine politics or um, big corporations or any kind of track that a party might want to put me on. Um, so I can be actually responsive to the people. Um, and um, listen to them uh, without any kind of agenda um, that's coming from above me or... Just, um, just to follow up a little bit on yeah. that, when you uh, identify yourself as a member of the Green Party, just generally speaking, what do you want people to know that that means? I mean, there are a lot of people, obviously, who have a sense of the Green Party, probably often associated with environmentalism, but how do you describe it? What do you, uh, in brief, want people to know that that means? Uh, so the Green Party, uh, number one, is a party of peace. Um, it's an anti-war party, anti-violence party. Um, it's pro-environmentalism, which would be green economy, so jobs based on restoring infrastructure to be climate resilient, climate change resilient. Um, and it doesn't take money from corporations. And it's grassroots, which is actually hard to understand if you're not part of it. So all of the instructions, as it were, for a party member, for a party representative would come from below, from the people in the district. Thank you. Mr. Pagan, how, how do you consider yourself qualified for this position of assembly member, other than your 62 years in the district, yeah. as you mentioned? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, Adrian kind of hit an element of it. Um, I'm not beholden to anyone, and the fact that there's two Democrats here, it's really a face-off between the Democrats here, because the pre prevailing party in our district are six, over 68,000 registered Democrats, and the point I, wanna, I want to make with that, why I'm more qualified than this guy here is because 17 members of a committee or that put him here in this chair. The Reform Party put me here in this seat. Mind you, I'm a Democrat, a registered Democrat all my life, all right? And the reason for that is because the people deserve a choice. Uh, as I said, the prevailing party in our district are Democrats. So it was really a scheme. I'm getting, I wanna make my point why I'm the, I'm the better qualified candidate. The scheme of the, the, the political machine's scheme, the party leaders choosing uh, by way of committee, committee county votes. Uh, for example, we're trying to fill Brian Kavanaugh's seat, all right? He abandoned his post to go uh, to take the Senate seat. Brian Kavanaugh was voted by 17 members of a committee, all right, versus over 68,000 registered Democrats who live in our district, okay? So what does the county committee do now? They elect this guy here to get him on this panel here, all right? So what's happening here, the machine has robbed, they've done it before, 
the machine has robbed the opportunity for the people of our district to vote in a primary election. So I'm going I'm to stop you there, yes. Mr. Yes. Pagan. You're referring to some of the processes around special elections, and that actually yes. was a question coming yes. up. So we'll, we're going to come back to that. Oh. But that is that is okay. your time. So I'm going to move okay. to Mr. Cooper here on what makes you qualified. And Mr. Epstein, I know that he was talking directly about you, but we're about to get to you. So we'll come to you in a moment. Mr. Okay. Cooper, what Simple. makes you qualified? I represent the Republican Party. Mm. Uh, I'm proud to be a Republican, and I love being a Republican. I've been a Republican district leader now for 14 years. And I'm also a member of the, the Police Community Council, and I'm also just graduated from the, the emergency response team, which is a certain Office of Emergency Management. So I'm very well aware of every single part of that district as far as, you know, the citizens, Peter Cooper, Stytown, Lower East Side, uh, Murray Hill, Tudor City, everything. But I'm also a man that it is, I'm, I'm a moderate, and I like working with people on the bipartisan way. And even though that we don't have limited uh, of Republicans in our district, hey, we, hey, are you independents, Democrats, whatever, because we all are part of the district. My campaign is real simple. You know, it's our district, okay? I want to represent you, and I want to represent the people. That I don't, regardless of what your party affiliation is, we all have issues that we all know and love about. We all care about the same things. We want to solve the problems, and that's it. So you will be on the Republican Party line. So yes. what do you say to the many Democrats in the district in terms of why they should vote for you as a Republican? Won't you bring more of a Republican lens, even if, as you say, it's a moderate lens, right. to the, the job of assembly member? What would you well, say to those question. Democrats? Well, well, that's, right. that's an excellent question, because I know that the, the political climate right now is very, you know, raw. But it's real simple. I said, listen, okay, even though that I am part of the Republican Party, but I can bring to the table about, you know, an alternative to what the Democrats are doing, okay, especially in Albany right now, especially with Governor Cuomo right now. Because the thing is, Donald Trump is not on the ticket. Andrew Cuomo is. And that is it. Okay, so, we'll, we'll, we'll come back a little bit more to, to what that might mean on specific issues yeah. and also maybe more about Governor Cuomo since he will be at least in uh, September and November, mm -hmm. uh, on the ballot. But he's not on the ballot in April uh, when, you're, when this election is happening. Uh, Mr. Epstein, uh, first you can respond to Mr. Pagan as you wish, but also, please, uh, what makes you qualified to fill the job of assembly member? Yeah. Thank, you for the, thank you for the question. Uh, really, why I think I'm qualified to be the assembly member is what I've done in our community and around our city to represent the lives of New Yorkers. I've worked on dozens of pieces of legislation, worked with community organizers all over the city to think about what we need to do to improve the lives of regular New Yorkers. I've been a legal services lawyer for almost 25, 25 years, represented thousands of New Yorkers. I've heard their stories, I've heard their struggles, and I've heard how Albany is creating such dysfunction in their lives that they can't improve it, they can't move forward in the way they need to do. And what we need to do is send someone to Albany who has the experience and the qualifications to make a difference for our community and our city and our state. I've done it. I'll continue to do it. I did it when I sat on the Rent Guidelines Board and got a rent freeze. The first one in the 47-year history of the Rent Guidelines did it. I did it when I helped get legislation passed to stop harassment in New York City. I did it when I went to Peter Cooper Village in Stuyvesant Town to talk about tenant harassment and started legal clinics and housing clinics to help protect those tenants from eviction and displacement. And I'll do it when I go to Albany to represent this community in the Assembly. So let me follow up a little bit on what Mr. Pagan was talking about yeah. in terms of the process for getting nominated. Um, you obviously, in, in special elections, the, the parties nominate their choice to be on the ballot. There are no primaries. Uh, it's not nonpartisan, you know, where you just get on the ballot and, and that's who voters can vote for. So you, you were selected by party members, party insiders to, to be on the ballot. Uh, why was that? And would you be, you know, if you are in the Democratic majority in the Assembly, is it going to be that you would sort of toe the party line? That's, that's some of the concerns that people have sometimes around these special election choices. Yeah. Uh, so a really good question about the special election process and what I said during the, all part of the campaign and I'll continue to say is what we need to do is change how special elections happen in New York State. New York City has an open primary process for special elections and we need to do that for Albany elections as well. I've said it from the beginning of this campaign and I'll continue to say it. we need to go, but go to Albany, change the laws because it is a uh, you know, smoke room filled process. Yes, there were 200 people who were all Democrats who unanimously put me forward as a Democratic candidate, also I'm running on the Working Families Party line. 
Um, and I'm honored to take, take those lines, but I also know that it's our obligation to change that system. Just because the laws exist now doesn't mean that's the laws that exist in the future. I think it's our job to see these problems and change them. Like we need to change early voting in New York. It's a problem. We need to change it. There are lots of things we need to change in Albany, and I believe my skills and qualifications allow me to be able to do that. And just lastly on that, would you, um, why, why was it that you were so supported by uh, the Democrats in Manhattan who were making this selection? You know, what is it, how did you get uh, sort of tied with the party? What is it about, you know, how did you build those relationships? Well, well, good question about how I got connected to people in the district. I've lived in the district for over 20 years, raised my children in the district been a parent leader in the district, was a community board chair in the district. Uh, it was, uh, I've been deeply involved in our neighborhood and deeply committed to the work that's going on in our community. I've worked with all the local elected officials as well in my job running a legal services office and in my community hat. So people knew me, knew what I've done, knew my qualifications, and they believed in the vision that I had to support our community and talk about community organizing, talk about leadership development, talk about changing the culture of Albany, and they all supported me going forward. Thank you. So we're going to start with you this time, Mr. Cooper. Uh, the, let's talk more about the district. What are some of the major issues facing the district? Let's try to limit it maybe to the, your top three, let's say. Okay. Uh, but what are three big issues facing the 74th Assembly District, which as some have said, and I said in the introduction, uh, covers much of some of the east side of, of right. Manhattan. Right. Uh, Mr. Cooper, key issues facing the Number district. Number one problem right now, okay, especially in my neighborhood, in Alphabet City, is in NYCHA housing, okay? My main concern right now is the seniors, okay, and the uh, accessibility of uh, handicap, because there are no handicap accessibility ramps in none of my buildings. From, from all the way from East Houston all the way to 14th Street down. And it's like, and then all of us, then now um, the unemployment situation, which is youth unemployment, okay? Um, Workforce One and Henry Street Settlement are currently right now, are on, on the cusp right now of doing job training programs for, for youth for after school programs. The problem is right now, we're trying to get the word out to the, to the kids right now about what's going on. And you know, that's what I've been, been doing that for the past couple of months right now, just trying to get the word out as far as, you know, because we don't want our kids out there in the streets, especially now in the summertime, now, because it's getting ready to get warm right now. You know, we want them to be constructive and, and a lot of other things. And also the rents, okay? Um, now, um, we're going to come back on solutions. So I think you gave us three, and that's that's okay. about time. So okay. we'll move sure. on to Mr. Epstein. Sure. Uh, two Top or three, three issues that sure. are going on in the district. Yeah. I think one is affordable housing, not just public housing, but all housing, rent-stabilized rent housing, Mitchellama housing. Second is the MTA, the problems with the L train closing down, the lack of accessible stations when it reopens, the issues of public uh, transit, buses and subways, and how poorly they're being operated. And third is public education, really pushing better public education, funding public education, supporting public education, elementary, middle, high school, and college. Thank you. Ms. Craig Williams? Yeah, so the, I agree with my um, fellows up here. And also, climate change is a big issue in our community. And I think uh, we need long-term solutions. And we need to talk about that, because most of our district is in a flood zone. Um, and we are going to have more big storms. This hurricane season is supposed to be worse than last year's, and we need actual climate change resilience plans, um, and also housing and education are my top three. Okay, Mr. Pagan, issues facing the district. There's so many issues, and it's hard to prioritize them, but I'll put the first three. I mean, to, to a parent who has children going to school, their number one priority is public education, but let me start with the three I have. Um, number one is affordable housing. And I want to target specifically NYCHA because NYCHA residents are the ones that are suffering the most right now. Not to neglect uh, Mitchell Lama or Section 8 or, or, or the problems that might come up in 2020 with Stytown and Peter Cooper Village, but NYCHA has been enduring problems for so many years. It's deliberate. NYCHA has been deliberately neglecting uh, the upkeep and the maintenance of our buildings because they have a plan. They want to uh, eventually use that as an excuse. The, the deterioration of NYCHA, they want to use that as an excuse to then turn it over to, to private developers. Okay, so it's, a, it's, it's really a scheme. The ones who, that are... Who, sorry, the, the, who's the they there? Who's, who's the, who's, who has the scheme there? NYCHA. 
NYCHA is the one with the scheme. It's called Next Gen. I'll uh -huh. give you a specific name. So the name. NYCHA leadership and the Yeah, the and NYCHA leadership. Okay. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that includes, uh, uh, I, I would include also uh, Nida Velasquez, who's our representative congresswoman who, who deals with HUD on the issues that has affected NYCHA, especially in our neighborhood. And um, uh, as I was saying, so NYCHA, affordability in, in, in NYCHA, because what's happening is the, it's the poor and the ones on fixed incomes that are getting squeezed out of NYCHA. And NYCHA was designed to help the poor and those on fixed incomes. Um, my second issue will be the issues on MTA. Um, and, uh, oh, and, and, and my third issue would be the closing of Rikers Island, which, which it's, I th it's obvious that it was, um, it was more of a political, uh, it was more politically motivated, the closing of Rikers Island, rather than something to seriously deal with the, the, the issues there. So just briefly um, on that, yes. and then we need to move on. Yes. Are you against uh, closing Rikers Island and moving the inmate population to the borough-based well, facilities? Yeah, I, I would have been against it, but it's already on track. Okay. So now we got to take measures. Right, I would have been against it okay. because Rikers is is a, it can be repaired there, and they should have emulated. I worked I, I worked for the state prison system for about eight nine years, so I'm intimately acquainted with how the prison system works, and I've dealt with uh, ex offenders, felony offenders, f like, for like nine years. So I have a lot of experience in dealing with the prison system. So the next works. question, really, yes. and, and let's oh. just give you a chance to, to continue on that thought. The okay. next question is, what are a couple of policy proposals that you want to pursue to address those questions, you, uh, those issues you've identified? So I'll, I'll mm -hmm. come back around, but since you're talking criminal justice reform, yes. 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 what's something you want to do about it? From your experience, from mm -hmm. what you've seen, uh, what, okay. is, what is a policy proposal that you would bring to the state legislature? Well. The number one thing I would do as a state legislator, I'm, I, I'm, I will cr create a committee within the state legislature to, de to, 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 to deal specifically with the, uh, with the commission report. There was a commission uh, that was um, created for a plan to close Rikers Island in 10 years. Um, and, and that way the state will have s some control over their decisions. And my primary concern is public safety. That's number one. Of course, I have a concern about uh, treating those that are in custody in a humane manner. And I understand that firsthand. I mean, when I, when I worked for the state prison system, I used to own a business years ago. I hired four inmates that were being, well, three were being unconditionally released. One was being released on parole. That was my way of giving back to the community. It was a construction, demolition business. And... Uh, the point I'm making is I, underst I, I understand the need for rehabilitation for these, uh, the offenders that are in prisons that are coming out. Uh, we need a holistic approach to this issue. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to stop you there. We'll yeah. come back on okay. some, something else. But I want to come mm -hmm. uh, to Mr. Cooper, either on an issue you identified or, or something else that came up. Right. Uh, but what are a couple of things that you want to bring to the legislature to address issues that are central to the district? And I will say I heard just about everybody, it seems like, agree that affordable housing right. is clearly a key issue. I'm right. sure there's others that we right. can all agree on for the district okay. are issues. But clearly that's one that I think people will be interested in hearing everybody's ideas on. But if there's other things you want to throw in as well, okay. please. Okay. Um, I'm going to piggyback, okay, um, with Mr. Epstein's about the MTA, the L train, okay. Right now, there is a station being built on 14th Street. Why? Okay, why are you building a brand spanking new station where you could have taken that money and reorganized and rebuilt the, the existing L train service, like 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 3rd Avenue, okay? And because I was talking to some construction guys, it was like, okay, they're putting accessibility, you know, elevators. Okay, then take that and put it in the old stations and, re you know, allocate. You know, why are you spending millions of dollars, you know, just of, of, of nothing? I know that you, you're creating jobs for the construction. That's fine. That's great. But you could have taken that whole resource and rebuilt, reconstruct the entire L service from 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 3rd Avenue. Because now... I understand that they're doing another billion dollar renovation for Hurricane Sandy. That's fine. Again, why go through all this construction for nothing when you're just taking all that money and just 
So let me ask you quickly, you identify that problem as either a community member or as the assembly member, right. which would have more weight behind it. Obviously, right. you're an elected official. Right. What do you do? How do you, as an assembly member, if you are elected, right. identify that problem with the MTA? How do you get that addressed? I would go to the governor and to whoever I can talk to. I say, hey, look, guys, look. I understand the hurricane standing situation was a big problem. I know, I'm in the district. I know. I know exactly what's going on there from the Brooklyn line and the Manhattan line, things like that. We don't need to waste billions of dollars on brand new spanking projects. Just take that money and revamp, rebuild, reconstruct everything. So you go right to the top, to, right to, to the, the governor. Top. Okay, right. got I mean, it. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Epstein, uh, a policy proposal or two that you would bring yeah, to Albany? I also want to respond to something Mr. Pagan just sure. said around. First of all, I have to say that I have to really disagree with him about Congresswoman Velasquez. She's been a champion for public housing. She's been going to DC fighting for funds. The federal government and the Republican Party in Washington has cut and cut and cut funding for public housing. She's been there pushing for additional funding. I think she's not trying to privatize it. She's trying to protect it and save it. And I really think we should honor the work that she's doing. In relationship to criminal justice reform, I think we have to close Rikers. I've been to Rikers. I've had families have stayed in Rikers. Friends have been in Rikers. It's a terrible place. The violence in Rikers is through the roof. We need to close that facility. We need to close it sooner than later and open up local facilities and make it safer for people who are there. But more importantly than that, in the criminal justice reform, we have a bail system that's broken. It is affecting black and Latino children at higher rates than, than white children and white adults. And we need to reform bail. We need to reform bail bond systems. We need to talk about how people are being incarcerated in the system because race and class. And we, don't, we are ignoring those issues. Um, the MTA, I actually feel like we need to have an accessible L train line. And people know the first avenue exit for the L train is the only exit. It is crowded. It's not accessible. That's why they're building an, an entrance on Avenue A. Not only do we need to have an entrance on Avenue A and making that accessible, the entire L train should become accessible because people with disabilities live in our city. They live in, and they live in different stops and they live in different stations. And we need to make sure that the subway system is accessible to, the, to everyone. Just on the issue, I want to talk about affordable Lastly, housing. Please, yes. Yeah, just on affordable housing, we need to change the rent stabilization laws. We need to strengthen the laws. We need to talk about MCI, major capital improvement reform. We need to talk about reforming preferential rents and making sure tenants are protected. We need to talk about vacancy uh, bonuses that landlords shouldn't be getting. And on public housing, we need to have a state commitment for public housing dollars on capital dollars, the $30 billion need for public housing in New York, New York City. We need to talk about how we can really start funding public housing so people don't live in degraded conditions. People can get the repairs that they need, and people can get the service that they need. Right now, we're, the state is underfunded public housing in its capital needs, and we need to change that. Thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to you in just one minute. I'm going to give Ms. Craig Williams a chance to talk about a couple of policy proposals, then we'll come back to you, yeah. Ms. Brigham. I also want to talk about closed Rikers. I think we need to close Rikers as soon as possible, and cash bail. Most people on Rikers haven't even committed a crime, which is beside the point they shouldn't. Um, yes, they are disproportionately affecting poor Latino black people and they're just waiting for trial. They get pressured into um, taking plea bargains and then they're in the system. But yeah, so 100% close Rikers, close it yesterday, um, free them all and cash bail. And um, also regarding criminal justice reform, the number one thing we can do is fund public education. Um, if we have our schools had, you know, really great after school programs, if everyone was getting an education and felt like they were valued, uh, people who can't afford to have a lot of books at home, if they had beautiful libraries, I mean, that's how we prevent crime, um, especially crime that is about poverty. It's not about um, being a bad person. It's about not having access to the things that people in power take for granted. Um, and Yes, for uh, for doing that, <laughs> I would I would propose you know drastically cutting the NYPD budget and grad drastically raising the NYCHA budget, okay. like kind of flip them. Thank you, Mr. Pagan. Uh, okay. You you mentioned some criminal justice uh, reform yes, I activity, to touch but upon but that. I want to yes. touch upon uh, Nidia Velasquez uh, uh, in regard to NYCHA developments. Nidia Velasquez, all right, she she has. Um, she has a. She's pushing the RAD. You familiar with RAD? Of course, right? The rental agreement. Uh, um, a rental agreement. Um, a demonstration, actually an experiment. Okay. She raised the cap 
from 15,000 units to be experimented with to 455,000 units. Okay, to experiment with, you're, you're gonna, you, she's actually experimenting with 455,000 families who live in NYCHA. A recent audit done by the feds show that RAD does not guarantee affordability. In fact, what it's doing is, it's doing exactly what I mentioned before. It's, it's allowing private developers to come in, take over. She's, she is using Section 8 to squeeze in the private developers. It's, it's a scheme. It's a predatory scheme. All right? And it's affecting the poor people. The ones that are going to get hurt are the poor and, the, and those on fixed incomes, including the elderly who are, who are the majority on fixed incomes. In regard to closing Rikers Island, I worked in the state prison system for years. All right? One of the prisons I worked in was, was uh, Sing Sing, a maximum security prison. Ninety percent of the inmates that are in Sing Sing, a maximum security prison, came from Rikers Island. They're there for murder, rape, sodomy, assault, serious crimes, okay? So, you know, not everybody in Rikers Island is innocent. That's number one. Number two, they should, the, um, all right, let me use an example. I'm going to need prison. you to wrap, wrap up, please. Okay. Mid-Orange State Prison was recognized as one of the well-running, practically no violence prisons in New York State, a, a state study proved. They should emulate what the, the construction and the management style of Mid-Orange State Prison and apply that to Rikers Island. Believe me, that would work. Okay, Mr. Uh, Cooper, you wanted to make a point, I believe, on yeah. either Rikers or something else yeah. I saw you yeah. flagging. Yeah, because I'm hearing closing, closing, closing. Here's the question, where are you gonna put them? Where are you gonna put these people, okay? Where are you gonna, you know, like, you know, put all of these, you know, people who are offenders, okay? Rikers Island needs to stay open. Now, I am not for closing Rikers Island. It needs to stay there. There's a reason why Rikers Island is Rikers Island. Okay. Okay. And and that's it. So I, mean, I know the 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 city uh, has an outline of a plan. There's obviously some state yeah. jurisdictional issues and oversight right. that comes into play. Yeah. But let's let's return to some uh, you know state yeah, legislative. Where are you see Mayor De Blasio, you know, you know, he's like, okay, you can't you just force people to accept these you know these prisoners in these new jails. You got to talk to the people. You got to let them know what's going on. Okay. You can't you just close a uh, prison. Then all of a sudden, hey guys. We got new prison here, new prison. Come on now. This is about public safety. This is about law enforcement. Understood. Okay. So I've heard a few um, things mentioned that relate to the state uh, legislature and the state budget. There was recently a new budget passed that kicked in for the April 1st start to the new fiscal year. Um, I want to give everybody a chance. Uh, I know bail reform that a couple of folks have mentioned was one of the things that did not make it into the budget that many Democrats and advocates were, were pushing for, so we've, we've sort of heard that. Rent regulations, not so much this budget, but will be coming up again, has been dealt with before. But I want to give everybody a chance to evaluate the state budget that was just passed and talk about anything that you think uh, either was good about it, was bad about it, uh, missed opportunities, things that you'd want to pursue in the future. And, you know, for folks uh, not that familiar at home, you know, the state budget is often where a lot of new policy gets decided as well. It's not just a span spending plan. It's also very often where uh, policy items are, are decided and then the funding attached gets decided as well. There still is the legislative session in Albany in the next few months, so again, you're welcome to talk about things that you would like to pursue when you get up there. You obviously, if you uh, are victorious here, you've missed the, the state budget, um, but I want to give everybody a chance to weigh in, and we're going to start with uh, Mr. Epstein here. Yeah, thank you about uh, the question around the state budget and what was in and what was, at, was not in. I think the things that uh, were in was the tax reform, as we know, uh, the president, uh, passed the tax bill last year that really aff affected blue states like New York. It's really, it would be really horrible for millions of New Yorkers. I think they fixed it in the state budget. Well, hopefully it'll be able to be a fix. So I think that's a positive thing. Things that didn't happen is the early voting. New York is one of the lowest states in the country on voter turnout. We have no early voting system. We really need an early voting system. That fell off the table this year, unfortunately. We need to figure out we can get that done in this legislative session. Other things, bail, bail, bail reform, I think we need to talk about that because it's a, 
fail and the bail system is a race and class system and we should just acknowledge that's how it works and we need to reform that. The rent laws, as you mentioned, may be up for next renewal for next year, but the hope is we can get something done in this legislative session around preferential rents, uh, vacancy bonus, or MCI reform. I think those are real potentials for this year as well. I, I am, I'm really hopeful around those things that, that can happen. And I think uh, bottom line is while we have some conversations around fixing the MTA, what we really need to do is talk about funding the rich. Millionaire and billionaire taxes to fund public transportation. We're talking about congestion pricing as a tool, and there were some things that were passed in the budget around that, just around uh, for higher cabs. There's a longer conversation around congestion pricing, which I think we need to have, but we need to talk about taxing people who can afford it, and we're not doing that right now in New York, and I think we need to do that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Craig Williams, your evaluation of the, of the recently passed state budget. Yes, I mean, uh, I agree with most of what Mr. Epstein said. Um, you know, Cuomo likes to pretend that he's a progressive so he can talk about all the things that he pushed for in the budget. Um, and yeah, early voting seems like a no-brainer. That shouldn't have fallen out. And um, bail reform, yeah, it's absolutely among the cruelest things that we do. Uh, most people at Rikers Island are waiting for trial because they can't pay bail. They are not convicted criminals. Um, despite the fact that convicted criminals are anyway not representative of actual crime. I agree we should tax the rich to pay for more things. And, um, you know, if I, got, <laughs> if I got elected, that would represent a, a great sea change in politics <laughs> to have mm -hmm. a green representative. Um, so, Thank yes, you. I would do a lot. <laughs> Mr. Pagan, your evaluation of the budget? Yes, um, I've lived 50 years in NYCHA development, still live there. I just celebrated 50 years last February. Um, uh, Cuomo received a lot of criticism from what I, what I heard out there in regards to the $250 million that he, in the budget, he's um, given to NYCHA. And I agree with Cuomo what he's doing. I, I, I th he's smart. He knows what he's doing because... I, what I see him doing, he doesn't want to abet the profligacy of NYCHA. NYCHA don't, does not have moral restraints on how to spend their money. They are wasteful. They, they mismanage. They misappropriate money. I could give you details, but I, don't, I, I can give them to you later, because I've lived in NYCHA for 50 years. I've been enduring it and seeing it with my own eye, eyes. I'm not just, I'm a victim of it. So I, I see what's going on. And an independent monitor is so important. All right, so let's give NYCHA $250 million and let's somebody, let, let an independent monitor watch how they spend this money because they have been so wasteful in all these years and so many years of, 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 of not properly maintaining uh, the NYCHA developments, especially right here in our district. So I hear you saying that yes. you like what's in the state budget related to NYCHA, you approve of the governor's executive order that yes. accompanied it. Anything, uh, just briefly, 10 seconds, anything you feel like did not make it into the state budget that you're disappointed by? Okay. That I'm disappointed by? Well, well, the, the bail bond issue, I'm glad it didn't pass because it has to be examined carefully. You just can't say, I understand, when I've worked in the prison system, blacks and Latinos, Latinos and blacks, that's all I see coming into the system. We have to go deeper to the root of the problem. All right, the bail bond issue, you're putting a Band-Aid on a compound fracture. We don't want Band-Aids on a compound fracture. We want to repair that compound fracture, put a cast on it, and let it heal. Thank you. Okay. okay. Got it. Mr. Cooper, uh, the state budget. Okay. Let's just get one thing clear here. Taxing the rich is not going to work. Not going to happen, never will. Okay, so you can, you, just, you can throw that out the window because there's no way in the world that I'm going to back it and, and I'm pretty sure the assemblymen and the Senate, they're not going to do it either because we need wealthy people in our state. That's how we pay taxes. That's how, you know, you know this is how business is done. Wall Street and the whole nine yards. So we need these people, you know, because without that, you know, we wouldn't have a state budget, okay? And as far as um, uh, bail, uh, bail reform and things like that, now I'm... Again, I agree with Mr. Bagan about oh, let's just be careful with this because every person has a different issue, okay, regarding bail, regarding what, you know, crime is committing, things like that. So bail is an individual issue. So we can't just do it across the board. It has to be examined, okay? And secondly, uh, about NYCHA budget, the money is there. The money has always been there. It's the leadership, okay? That's the problem. The problem is the leadership from the city all the way to Albany. 
So we need to reevaluate the leadership of who's handling the money. If you want to reform that, let's open up the books. Let's find out where all the money is allocated. Let's find out what's going on from, from that's just not just in my district, but all the boroughs. So, so we're in our uh, last couple rounds of questions here uh, for the debate, and thank you uh, for your participation thus far. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to start with you, Ms. Craig Williams, here on this question. Uh, uh, the district is obviously on, uh, much of it is on the coastline, and there are issues around storm protection. Uh, what would you do, what would you pursue around resiliency, around storm protection, uh, if you are elected to the state assembly? Well, for one, like funding NYCHA, um, giving more funding for actual resilience, planning for like the basement, the first floor, um, because even if there's storm protection, the floods will come up again. So we need um, to study and learn from, say, the Netherlands, um, what to do when your building gets flooded so that you can prevent the kind of things that happened during Sandy when we didn't have power for 10 days. Um, and just we need to do it now and soon and you know i'm going to stop you there because okay. we do want to get to closing okay. statements after this round sure. so mr pagan <laughs> something you do about uh, sustainability and, and flood protection yes i would certainly do my best to give it all the funding that it needs of course it should be overseen a couple of weeks ago i did attend a meeting where the people who are actually designing and are going to build the projects, uh, the project uh, along the East River where I live. I, li I look out my window, I see the East River. In fact, I saw the East River come over. <laughs> what an experience. Well, I never saw anything like that in my life. But the point I, I want to make is, I want to make is that I will fully fund it. I saw the plans that they're doing, outstanding plans. In the meeting, though, there were people, the people that were like, well, it looks ugly. Uh, what are you going to do about aesthetics? And, and I'm like, it, I saw these, you know, cement and steel. I mean, true, they do look like the the strongholds that the Nazis built in France during the occupation, right? But, but, but it it, it looks like a plan that is going to work to prevent the East River from from flooding us again. From what I saw, it's a beautiful plan. And you want to make sure it, and I it will gets fund funded. It. Thank I you. I will fund it, Mr. Cooper. Well, being a member of um, CERT team. A community emergency response team, CERT Team 3. We are working with CERT Team 6, which is Peter Cooper Stytown, about education. What we're going to do in the summertime is we do a little street fairs about um, being prepared, getting gold bags, um, what to do, where to meet, um, emergency rations and things like that. You know, because we want people to be educated on, unfortunately, on, again, we're going to have another hurricane, super storms and things like that. It's about evacuation, how to properly get people together and properly evacuate their homes. Now, as far as the walls and everything else, that's the Army Corps of Engineers, okay? I will be commissioning the Army Corps of Engineers because they, they, they're, they're masters of this. So what we, have, what we do is commission them along with um, the state emergency management in accordance with county emergency management to figure out how to handle that, not just our district, but all the way down the financial district, all the way down to the, to the west side. So we're talking about an entire island here. Sure, understood. Thank yeah. you. And uh, Mr. Epstein. Yeah, on the resiliency question, I think we need to talk about flood protection. And I think the walls are important. I think we shouldn't sacrifice uh, things that we have, like the Asher Levy playground shouldn't be divided in half just because we, we, they don't want to spend a little more money to go around it. I think we need to talk about how the bridges and how people are going to access the East River for most of the year and making sure that the flood protection also is usable. We need to talk about using environmentally sound material. We need to talk about green material. And we need to talk about expanding opportunities for solar in New York City as well as other alternative sources of energy so long-term sustainability is, is on our table. Thank you. And actually, we'll just keep going that same direction for closing statements. Okay. Uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Craig Williams. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for hosting it, and thank you everyone else for participating. Um, my name is Adrian Craig Williams. I'm the Green Party candidate. Um, I'm, you know, the most progressive person in the race. Um, I will fight for you and uh, your families. And even if you don't have a lot of money, even if you don't have any documents, even if you're from another country, even if you can't vote. So, thanks for your support. Thank you, Mr. Pagan. I'm running for office to tackle all these issues and more, but the primary reason why I'm running for office is to give the people the opportunity to choose their candidate, the one they want to represent them. 
I'm talking about electoral reform right from the local level. We don't need party leaders choosing for us. We don't need 17 people of a committee to choose the elected official to represent you. We need everyone, not just the registered Democrats, the Republicans, the Green Party, the Working Families, the, the Reform Party, who I thank greatly, who put me in this position to be here. I'm a Democrat. It's really a face-off between me and this guy here, two Democrats, because really, I mean, throughout the history, in all my life, Republicans never won, let alone third-party candidates. It's always a battle between the Democrats. And they, the, the, this contaminated d Democrats that we have now, which I'm so ashamed of because I'm a Democrat, okay? The point I'm making is the people deserve to choose their candidate. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Well, I am a Republican, proud to be a Republican. You know, I have been with the Republican Party for going on now 18 years, and I've been a Republican leader for 14 years. And I'm running in this race because I, I am the alternative. I want people to say, hey, okay, enough with this Democratic battle stuff that's going on. Let's go with the alternative, okay? I ran against Brian Kavanaugh. I would like to replace him, you know, a Brian replacing another Brian. And I, I want people to prosper. I want people to you know, have choices, school choices, um, public safety choices. I mean, just choices just to, you know, live their lives in the better. And, you know, I'm pro-police. I am pro-law um, enforcement. I'm pro-business. You know, I put lower taxes, and I'm just making people, I want people to make as much money as possible because I want their families to prosper. I want them to feel good about themselves, and I want them to be educated about themselves. Thank you. And Mr. Epstein with the final closing statement. First, I want to thank you for moderating this debate. It has been really helpful to have a lot of issues exposed here. I've lived in this community for decades. I've raised my children in the community. I've worked hard to, as a parent leader, as a community leader, as an activist, to make the difference in the lives of New Yorkers. And my hope is by being brought, sent to the assembly, being sent to Albany, I'll be able to talk about my progressive values, get things done, organize, bring people together to make the difference with the lives of regular New Yorkers who are struggling. Every day they're struggling. I saw it when I sat on the rent guidelines board where thousands of people said, oh, even a 1% increase in rent, my rent might mean I would be evicted. Seeing people with put into homeless shelters, seeing people not surviving. It is our job to understand the issues of New Yorkers and go to Albany and make a difference for them. I hope I've earned your support today. Thank, thank you. I want to thank the candidates for participating in today's debate. Again, the special election for the 74th Assembly District is being held April 24th, a Tuesday. You do need to be registered to vote to participate, and you must live within the State Assembly District. For more information about voting, locating your poll site, and all the candidates, you can visit the League of Women Voters website at lwvnyc.org, gothamgazette.com, or mnn.org. Thank you for watching Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.